Okay. okay, welcome back, uh, everybody. Uh, so today uh, I will discuss the what I would call the bipartite theory. So, um, one of the questions that I would like to discuss, hopefully by the end of the lecture today, is an, uh, the question of um, what is the probability that a random polynomial with Boolean coefficients is an irreducible polynomial? Okay. So, today, Time permits, um, it may not, but I guess if time permits, we can also show. Both of these results will come out of what I call the bipartite theory. But before I do that, perhaps to set the stage a little bit, uh, let me see, uh, let me try to illustrate how one can view whatever we've been discussing for the last couple of days in an abstract sort of way, and perhaps uh, orient it towards some sort of algebraic applications. At the heart of what, of what we've been doing is, of course, the study of prime numbers and um, how many prime divisors a natural number has. This is the Eric Schatz result. And we understand, of course, prime numbers as the building blocks of all natural numbers. But there are other contexts in mathematics where there are other building blocks. And so these building blocks can be used as, you know, you can use the, the word prime as a metaphor to understand how these building blocks work. One uh, typical example, and it's actually historically, I, I have a survey article I think I wrote in the Kerala Proceedings uh, for Monikam, I think it might have appeared already with my student Archita. Um, what, we, what we had there was a survey of um, applications of this erdish katz principle in algebra. And it is really amazing that, uh, if you, as I said, you go back to history and check these and you find that um, there are comical in events taking place. Um, in parallel worlds. So more or less around the time that um, Erdős and Katz were proving their theorem, Goncharov in Russia, here this paper's in Russian, was investigating um, the structure of the symmetric group. So you may recall if sigma is a permutation then sigma has a unique decomposition as a product of this term. Okay, so 
sometimes that's the way. This is not to study this in basic algebra course. Okay, so in some sense, disjoint cycle, I mean cycles play the role of primes. So in this setting, Omega epsilon to be the number of disjoint cycles in this unity condition. So I'm using this notation omega of sigma deliberately. Mm. This is kind of analogous to. So we may begin to ask, once we have the metaphor, we may ask if the Erdős cat thing goes through. And this is exactly what Goncharov is doing. In the 1940s, Goncharov showed Essentially, uh, omega of sigma that there is a there is a Erdős cap law. Before we before I state it, um, let me just make some rhetorical remarks. So the independent of, he was, he was, he was um, not aware, I don't want to use the word ignorant, he was not aware of the work of Ernest Cap. Nor was he aware of the powerful analogy to the Harding Lamont. He was just interested as an algebraist. How many factors are there? Okay. I mean, let's. I, I don't want to go too much into detail with this thing because I'll run out of time otherwise. But let me just give you a kind of uh, tantalize you perhaps with. some sense of delight with respect to <coughs> what, what one can expect. I mean, so we have the, the work of Paul Turan. You know, I'm the one that's coined the word uh, Turan sieve. Turan did not discover Turan sieve, okay? Um, Turan sieve is essentially the bipartite sieve that I'm going to talk about. Um, you can see <coughs> that there's a, there's, a, there's a general principle. And we can try to imitate the work of Turan in this context. So what, is, what does that suggest? Well, we have to calculate omega sigma, and we have to calculate omega of sigma squared. As sigma runs through the permutations and see what these are. I mean, these are things that you, everybody in this room can you know, uh, see that you have to do this in order to find out what is the normal order and what is the just what do you, what do you expect as the the mean value? What do you expect the variance to be? And then the guess the Erdős cap law. So let's let's begin with this. Um, let's say sigma of ten, omega of sigma. Um, I'm sorry, it should be suggestive. We will say this way. We will use pi. To be a disjoint, uh, to be a cycle, 
pi is a cycle, and we will just put pi divide sigma one. Hmm? So the sub, every time I use pi, it'll just be a cycle of any length, different length. And you do the obvious. So here, sigma is like n. Pi is a component of sigma. So if pi is a component of sigma, pi is a cycle of length L of pi, let's say. I've already used up L of pi letters. And I'm only left with n minus L of pi. Therefore, any permutation on the remaining letters would work. So this guy here is nothing but n minus L of pi factorial. <coughs> right? As we run through all the cycles, we, we find this. So therefore, now let's cycles can go from one cycle to n cycles. So it's a k, it's one to n. So L of pi equals k, so n minus k factorial. The question is, how many k cycles are there? No, no, wait, wait, don't rush, don't rush, okay. How many k cycles are there? So I have to choose k elements from n, let's n choose k, And then I have to arrange them, okay? And so they're k factorial, but the cyclicity k minus one factorial. It's a little bit of thought tells you that. Hmm? So now what do we have? We have summation, k going from one to n. N choose k is what? N factorial over N minus k factorial. K factorial. The N minus k factorial here. K minus 1 factorial there. And what comes out of the wash is to some n factorial summation k going from n to n summation. Isn't that interesting? Average number of disjoint cycles in a random permutation is log n. So the that's the average order. <coughs> then you can you can do um, the um, calculation for <coughs> summation sum of Ligge squares. And then uh, I'll leave that for the next slide. Can you do this slide? And when you do that, you find that the variance <coughs> is essentially uh, log n. And therefore, one based on this baby calculation, immediately you would get. should be the thing, the analog in this context, n squared. And that's that we're going to have just go on and on and on, banging away for pages and pages. If you set it up correctly the way we did it yesterday, of course that setting is not enough because we're going to do deal with ordinary sequences, but there's obviously a more general setup, which hasn't really not been done. But anyway, this has um, a normal is an interesting thing. And you know, there are lots and lots of other contexts too. Uh, decomposition theorems and Lie groups, etc. You can play this game all over the place. So, uh, which hasn't been done in my opinion, as far as I can tell, but certainly <laughs> applications to algebra in this context are very interesting. Now, with these two things in place, it seems that, and I've been, I've been toying with 
what is the general way to say this? And um, uh, as I keep telling my students, it's extremely difficult to think in a very simple way. Um, to strive for simplicity is actually not easy. And um, the simplest things are the, the things that elude, elude us, right? So here, uh, I'm going to try and present to you one of the simplest presentations of stiff theory that I can think of. Hmm? Uh, this, is, this is even easier than Eratosthenes' theory, what I'm going to present. Not only is it easier, but it'll give you better results than Eratosthenes' theory. So let's let x equals a comma b be a bipartite graph. Uh, we'll make it finite. Finite bipartite graph. So in other words, we have a bunch of vertices here. Independent vertices, there's no adjacency relation in these groups. So <laughs> a vertex is joined here or a vertex is joined there, that type of thing. This is the way this uh, graph is going to look. Okay, so so far it's a finite graph. A and P are both finite vectors. For each uh, we will say, uh, let me just say, we will say, we will write. We will write A tilde B if A and B are adjacent. Okay. So A, I'm going to use the little letter A for elements in A, capital A, and little letter B for elements in capital B. <coughs> and uh, omega of A is actually the degree of A, but A, omega of A is the number of B and B <coughs> such that A is adjacent to B. I, I could call it degree of A, but I don't, I won't do that. Okay, I'll just put omega of A for psychological reasons. See, this whole symbology in psychology is, is very fascinating, isn't it? Because how do you, if you choose the right symbol, it's kind of worse. But if you choose the bad symbol, it doesn't work. So, in the spirit of this previous example, motivating example, let's calculate summation omega of A and summation omega of C. You know what these are, but I'm going to keep saying it. <coughs> because it's so simple, it is often overlooked. Things are so simple, we just ignore them. Maybe you're coming over only over the vertices in A? Yep, only vertices in A. Of course, you have this silly handshake theorem in graph theory, right? You know, so <laughs> the sum of the degrees here is equal to the sum of the degrees here, but don't go there. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But if you know too much, it impedes the progress. All right. Uh, for each B, and B, of course, the degree of B is the 
the number of vertices adjacent to A. Number, uh, number in uh, A, in A, A is adjacent to B. Okay. And now um, I will write this as in other words, what proportion of the vertices in this set are adjacent to B? Delta of B proportion. See the analogy with us yesterday's lecture? Mm -hmm. <coughs> delta of B, and what is this E sub B? It's an error term. It won't be right on. But there will be some density, so you should think of this as some, of course, you could write you could write some crazy expression, but I'm saying you should think of this as an ex something which is independent of A. The density, the proportion, we will cal calculate. Then we see immediately summation omega of A. A is A. There's nothing but B and B. B is adjacent to A. A and A. Is the uh, significance of writing error term here? For example, if you know the marginality of A and degree of B, then delta B is, I mean, no, that in the effort. Hmm? If cardinality of A is known and degree of B is known, so hmm. we know what is delta B. Yes, we may not know that. Though. How? Now you just said, I'm just, I'm just setting it up abstractly. We may not know that. Yes. We've, I'm trying to say what proportion of the vertices of A are adjacent to B. Okay, so this, if you may not be able to write this in this fashion. You are forcing delta B to be a divisible adjacency of A? No, no. nothing, nothing. Just write it like this. Write it like that and just move on. <coughs> no, no, what I see, when uh, degree of B is some no, no, no. I'm just saying, suppose we have, suppose we write this in this fashion. Let us write this in this fashion where E sub B is some silly thing. And then let's continue. That's all. Nothing stopping me from doing that. If you want to write it in that fashion, then why do you use E sub B? I don't know. No, you'll see. You'll see. You're, you're, you're impatient. <laughs> I know what you guys are thinking. You could make E B equal to zero yeah, yeah, yeah. and delta B to be degree of B over A. Yeah, That's yeah. what you're saying. I'm saying don't do that. You know too much. <laughs> okay. Just write it like this. What am I doing? I am using the Turan calculation as a metaphor for some abstraction so that once I've got the abstraction in my hand, I can solve other problems, which I would never do because I am looking at the world through my narrow lens of you know, only one example. I don't want to do that. So let's enlarge the vision. I mean, so this is in, inspired by what we did before. What did we do before? How many numbers are divisible by a prime p? Well, greatest integer of n over p. And then it's 1 over p times n plus an error term. Yeah. That's all I'm doing. And the second part of the calculation is, when there are two primes, p and q, how many numbers are divisible by pq? n over pq, and again, one the error term. I'm using that as a metaphor to push myself in some sort of abstract setting. 
Believe me, you'll win. It's good to know very little. Okay, so so far so good. So let's do, so this is the analog. This is the analog of the first moment in the Turan paper. So we will then look at summation and we get the <coughs> So you write this as B1, B2, B3, N of B1, B2, where N of B1, B2 is the number of A such that A is equal to B1 and A is equal to B2. Now, of course, when B1 equals B2, we're back to degree B. So when B1 is B2, when B1 is not equal to B2, we have to turn B1 B2. So again, thinking probabilistically, the probability of B being adjacent to a vector, in, uh, uh, an element in A is delta of B. So I can now put, we can now hypothesize. So this was hypothesis one. And we'll put hypothesis two. N of B1, B2, such as B1, B2. <coughs> so some error term, which I will not discuss, but let's just think of the main term as, as, as it were something like this. Some sort of statistical independence. So this is for B1 not equal to B2. Some sort of independent result, asymptotic independence. So so when I put that in, what do I get? So what do I get? Summation A and A. Finally, we have A squared. Summation. This first one is the same as summation, only has A, A and A. Plus, uh, I have A, which is B1, such as B2. So the, in the previous calculation, which I personally rubbed off, uh, we had previous calculation, we had summation A and A, N of A is equal to um, cardinals of A, summation B and B, delta of B, plus summation B equals B. This kind of error, indicating that this is probably should be. Called
call the mu or something, the mean, or the expected value. So we will so this multiplicativity of delta is on order of infinity. Pardon me? Multiplicativity of delta is analog of independence. Right? Yeah, yeah, this, this is the analog of independence. Yeah, with some error. Uh, okay, so omega of a minus mu squared. So this is what, just as I said, being, you know, motivated by the, the, the classical calculation, we see immediately that this is summation a and a minus two mu summation a and a omega a plus mu squared times so what do we have we have uh, from here we have cos minus a summation delta t1 I have it, I have this here. So this is equal to a mu plus summation e v, right? This uh, cal this part of the a mu summation. Um, uh, oops. Um, so my, let, let's let, let, let me not worry about this term just yet. Hmm? So I got minus two mu times a mu plus summation e b e v plus mu squared a plus the summation this. Follow this. So this calculation here, uh, I, what have I done? I have squared it out, and then I use this formula. This formula here, uh, with the error. Oh, I have to put out the error terms here. This error term expression should be square root as well. Plus e v one e two v one minus e v two. So I put that in, and then the second term is minus two mu times the summation omega of a, summation omega of a, cardinality of a, plus this error, so the card, and then this last part is mu squared a, and then this, this term here that was left over from the first part of the calculation <coughs> is right here, and then you have this. So what happens? What happens is that um, a good chunk of this will simplify. What was this, uh, the mu was summation delta of b. Remember the density, the, the average? This is, this is really the value. So here, I noticed that this looks like mu squared, except the cross terms of the mu, right? So I'll write this as. minus summation b and b delta of b squared minus two mu squared a plus mu squared a and does I put 
taken care of this, this, and I've got to deal with these error businesses. And so I have this new A plus um, plus one minus two mu. summation a b b b and then this last error term a b one b two b one not equal to b two everybody okay with this so far i think i've got all the trouble you check please the little kitties uh, check that i've got that oh that's right notice that the main term, as it were, drops off. And now I see um, a bunch of things. So the main terms drop out. R now the of A. So this is a negative term. So most likely, uh, the thing that's going to matter is here. <coughs> because everything else is bunch of errors. So this is the way you should think. The stuff is probably going to be small. Don't worry about it too much. The main thing is probably going to, so the main terms cancel minus cardinality of A, summation of B and B, delta of B squared. So I've taken care of those two. And now I have a bunch of error terms. So I have 1 minus 2 mu, summation EB, and then summation EB1. Now we may we, uh, for for this so so now what do we what do we prove we may for the sake of elegance um, yeah we, we may for the sake of ele elegance um, notation e sub b b is just simply e sub b just this expression from the previous. Okay, then what do we have? We have the following theorem. Summation omega of A minus mu squared A and A equals <coughs> mu A minus omega of A delta of B squared. What term? Is there a term? Yeah, that is one minus two. Yeah, I, I combined that over here. I combined it here. That one EB and this, I shoved it in here with this notation. And then I've got this. Is that okay? Good. So, so we, we are making, is this a, because EB is already defined. Yeah. So this is your saying that the errors are of the same order or something? No, I haven't said anything about the errors. I put them there, EB is the error. We'll worry about the errors when, in, in specific context. So, I see. <coughs> uh, so there was a non-diagonal term and you have taken this. Yeah, this notation, yeah. Okay. As I said, not part of coming up with good notation is part of research. <coughs> you don't want to clutter up your calculations. See how neat this looks? For those of you who are familiar with strip theory, this is the kind of stuff you end up getting. And of course, you put absolute values, but this is an equality with error terms. 
Yeah, the Torah and Kabbalah. Well, I told at the very beginning, I think you came late, but um, this is motivated by the Turan inequality that I discussed in the early lecture. Yeah, yeah. And as I mentioned, this Turan series, the term that I started, it's based on this inequality. Yeah. So you have this uh, remarkable result, which is inequality. Why is this existing? Why is this interesting? I'll tell you why it's interesting. Uh, even in the simplest case of the natural numbers that we have played with, you've got, so here I should. Pardon me? No, you're defining the, 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 the. Yeah. So uh, even in the case of the Turan calculations, if you remember, Turan showed Of course, it's, it's there. It's Turan showed um, the summation omega ten minus log log x or log log n or whatever log log x is o x log log x. This is what the theorem, right? That was that was what his theorem was. Okay, and then we got normal order business, and he gave a simpler proof of the Hardy Ramanujan proof. However, look at this. If we just look at this in this con in, the, in the, the very example that motivated the discovery of this. There's a new result <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because delta the b's are the primes. So a's are the natural numbers, and the b's are the primes. And you're joining n, a natural number, to the prime p if p divides n. And so uh, delta of b is going to be one over p. 1 over b. And so it will be log log n, as we discussed in that theorem. But, but this is why the error term is important. That's why the error terms are important. Yes, exactly. So even in the, so our theorem, <coughs> refines Turan's derivation, because in that context, what do we have? We have summation p less than n, p less than uh, n, is it there? <coughs> x, p less than x, 1 over p. This is the, the delta of, uh, this is the mu, sorry, mu. Mu is equal to this, which is equal to log log x, plus o of 1. And the result that we are <coughs> getting is omega of n minus log log uh, minus uh, mu. Cardality of A is X, log log X, right? X times mu, which is log log X, plus O of X. That's what's coming out of the first term. And then everything else <coughs> minus <coughs> A. Well, A is X. Delta of B squared is 1 over P. It's a convergence theory, so it's O of X. Don't bother with this. What are the error terms? We agreed it was 1. And of course, in this calculation, <coughs> you really should put, you can put, as we discussed yesterday, this x to the epsilon trick. You don't need to calc, you don't need to worry about large primes. You, you know, because the large primes are only, only contribute O of one to omega of n. You could have made it x to the epsilon. Mm. So if you did that, then what happens with the error term here, it's O of one, it's p less than root x, q less than root x. It's O of x again. This is O of x. If this is, uh, this, sorry, this this is minus two. Um, oh, I, do I get a log log? Yeah, this is this is this is very small. This is nothing. This is log log x, and this is log log x. So this is really nothing. So you get something like this. You get an asymptotic formula instead of an O x got this term. And that's important because this is what to, uh, Mark Katz was asking. Can you calculate these higher moments? And so these numbers, if you did 4, 6, 8, and so on and so forth, the coefficients that you're going to get in the powers of log log x are going to match up with the normal distribution. 
So this is the first part of the puzzle. So even in the <laughs> doing this thing, even in the classical case, you get a, an asymptotic formula instead of an old case. Okay. Then you have to get your mind away from the classical setup and see what you get. So here we have the corollary. So we may be interested in how many elements in capital A in that bipartite graph, how many elements are there which are unrelated to any element in B? That means omega A is zero. So the number of A Whenever omega a is zero, I'm going to get a mu squared. So if it's less than or equal to, I divide everything here by mu squared. Well, this guy I'm going to draw simply because it's negative, and so it's, 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 I'm subtracting, therefore I can drop it, so I can do it. It may be important in other contexts, but it's good to have it there, to know that it's there, but it may be important. And then you have just two error terms. So what are the error terms? Well, one over mu, summation absolute value EV1, Two, and then my uh, plus two mu, uh, plus two rather, because I'm dividing out by mu squared, squared right? Oh, so the, uh, the mu squared, squared here, sorry. Dividing out by mu squared, so it's a two over mu summation um, e. This is a SIDM question. How many elements are there unrelated? Hmm? You get the trivial <coughs> estimate for this is the size of element in, in A, cardinality A. So you win by a mu. And then everything else is error. So this is um, the bipartite. So this was, uh, I mean, the data results <coughs> provided that those errors, which things which are errors, are really related. Yes, of course. Yeah. Somebody had a question. Yeah, I did not understand why it's dividing by mu squared. Oh, because every time omega of a is zero, this side is mu squared. Any other questions? Okay. So now with this in hand, let's uh, apply it to. Yeah. You had a question. Then delta beta, you are just neglected because it's a minus. It's a minus. Yeah, it's not. It's yeah. It's it, it's. This is a positive quantity. So if I'm trying to get an upper bound, I just ignore it. It may matter in some other example. So it's good to keep it there if you if necessary. But let's just throw it out for the time being. Okay, now let's um, apply it to the problem of polynomials. Um, so, intermediate. If 
find and feel the stone. So I just want to. This is probably the scene with the lazy delta performance. But I'll take my word. What is that word for Mobius in your computer? Well, you will see I'm not going to use Mobius. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll use I'll use Mobius version. But yeah, you need Mobius inversion, but also the algebra, the typical algebra course develops Galois theory before it derives it. And I want to show you, you don't need it. Okay. So let's consider F cube X. Okay. It's a Euclidean domain. Path transition domain mm -hmm. and every polynomial can be back into Euclid. So we can consider the uh, data function for this overall monic polynomial F in Q to the minus. norm that we will put <coughs> and this would be the analog of the zeta function and we f is a monic polynomial and it can be factored uniquely so I can go over all irreducible polynomials since they're monic and just then you have the Euler product Same, the same calculation of the Euler product distance. Hmm? This is the classical. Now, I can group together every irreducible polynomial of degree d will range from d to 1 to infinity, and every time I have a polynomial of degree d, I'm going to pick up a, another d s inverse, and I'm going to pick it up as many times as there are irreducible polynomials, monic irreducible polynomials of degree d. So n sub d is q over q to the power degree of d. Yeah, not n. So what is that? So n sub d is the number of um, monic irreducible polynomials of degree d. Right? So I can rewrite this z of s as the product. We go into Euclid's proof. It's 1 minus 1 over 3 over ds to the minus n. Now, on the other hand, this left-hand side is easily calculated. So let's put um, let's put t equals q to the minus s for simplicity. Then this is just simply t to the power degree f s. <coughs> and then now, the degree of s is going to go from 0 to infinity. Um, the monic polynomial of degree 0 it's just simply one. Okay. How many monic polynomials are there of degree n? Q to the n. You've got degree n, you've got x to the x to the n plus a one 
x to the n minus 1 dot 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 uh, up to 0 pi. So we've got 2 here. So this is a geometric series. And so this is nothing but uh, 1 minus q. Well, the BS is already here, so 1 minus q. So we have this on the left-hand side. And then when I use the fact that Q to the minus S is P, I have this product, V goes from point to infinity, one minus uh, G to the power B minus H. So, um, natural thing to do is to take logs of both sides. Minus log one minus qp equals summation minus n sub d log one minus qp. And using <coughs> the log expansion, Q to the M, Q to the M, over M, N goes to the infinity, D equals to summation, D equals to one infinity, E goes to one infinity, and C here is uh, Q to the E, E over E. Just using the logic. Better match up with the coefficient of q to the n on the right hand side. When are you going to get q to the n? Whenever d is e equal to n. So therefore, this is whenever d e is equal to n, you have n sub d <coughs> over e. So if I were to multi multiply top and bottom by d, I get uh, q to the n. <coughs> So the n's cancel, d is n, the n's cancel, so you get q to the n, d to the summation d divided n, d n sub d. So this is a formula you probably saw already, right? So you get this one. Usually, this formula is derived using after some Galois theorem. Meaning x, x, x to the q, yeah, and x to the q to the n minus epsilon factoring and all that stuff. It's not really necessary. Um, you, get it, you get it from the fact that it's a Euclidean domain and it's actually such an interesting data function trick. And of course, now you could apply Mobius inversion, but before I do apply Mobius inversion, as I said, knowing too much is an, is an impediment. Um, let's observe a few things. So theorem. thing is, of course, you can apply Mobius inversion And 
n to the next thing is that you could separate it out to the n plus other term. So if b is not 1, b is at least 2. So it's each term is at most q to the n over 2. That's the value of 1. So a lousy estimate for the error term is q to the n over 2 times the number of divisors of n. Why do I say it's lousy? <laughs> because it is. It is. OK, so what is it? It's over q. The other terms are much smaller than q to the n over 2. Why would you use that as the estimate for the other ones? OK? So you separate this guy. If n is even, d two, 2 occurs. But if n is odd, it doesn't even occur. So in the worst case scenario, let's say n is even, 2 occurs. But it only occurs once. That's q to the n over 2. But for the other one, it's at least 3 now. And so that's q to the n over 3 times the number of divisors. Number of divisors is terribly small. And so, really, this term is O of q to the n over 2. That is q to the n over 2. And the other terms, the other terms are q to the n over 3, dot, dot, dot. But the number of divisors is n to the epsilon, nothing. Much smaller than any power of q. So you can shove it back in, and you get q to the n to the rho q to the n over 2. Why I'm saying this is because it's going to, this is going to be significant in the, the last lecture, because we're going to worry about the error terms this time under here. Here, there's no log term. There's no extra p. <coughs> the other important thing is, as you know, um, in algebra, you want to construct finite fields. And the way you do it is by using the fact that if I have an integral domain and, uh, or unique factorization domain, like f2 of x, and I find an irreducible polynomial of degree n, then modding out by the ideal generated by f of that irreducible polynomial gives me a finite field of q to the n elements. And the question of does, does there exist a finite field of q to the n elements is easily solved uh, from this formula again, simply by, I would like to say, n sub little n is always positive, I want it's strictly positive. And the answer to that question is, yes it is. Because how should you look at the right-hand side? You should look at the right-hand side as, an, as the difference of two numbers written in base q. Okay, so q to the n is a number in base q. It's, uh, you know, what, one followed by a bunch of, so, so the, all the positive time, the times when d is, mu of d is positive, you get q to the n plus something, q to something, plus some q to something, and every time you've got q to something, in that position you're going to put a 1. In the other position you're going to put a 0. That's base q notation. So you've got a number with n digits corresponding to the plus sign of the Mobius function. And you have another number corresponding to the minus sign, which has fewer digits. When you subtract a number with more digits minus a number with fewer digits, you still get a positive number. So <coughs> and therefore, there's always a finite field of q to the n elements. This is not the way it's usually done, but it's good way to see it. Now, why do I need all this stuff? Okay, I mean, this is all interesting in its own right. Um, let me, uh, yeah, so, so let, let me say that if q equals p is a prime, we see 
number of irreducible polynomials small p of degree n is so basically that would give us degree one over n plus four degree n. Actually, it's even better, right? When you know, divide out by n, it's even better. It's PVN the n over two over n. Let's let's not worry about that. Even better. P the n over two over n, which is even better than the, the you know the pr classical prime number theory issues. Okay, so this is the number of irreducible polynomials. Now. Okay. Now let us look at. Let us now look at. AIs are always integers, of course. AIs are integers. They're in a box. The absolute value of AI is much large. Okay. We want to count the number of polynomials which are integers. And I'd like to show almost all the polynomials uh, in this collection are irreducible. That's what I'd like to show. What is uh, irreducible in this collection? Hmm? Over depth. Over. Yes. Polynomials which are irreducible quotient. Over depth. <coughs> so what we will do is we will consider A to be the collection of tuples. So, so I can identify any tuple with a polynomial. For capital B, I will take B P uh, prime less than or equal to Z, where Z will be chosen later. And so with each polynomial, so I want to um, say that we will join to a prime if the polynomial is irreducible not to. Now, 
question is this. If a polynomial is reducible over z, it's reducible to my proof. Therefore, in, once I've constructed this bipartite graph, the elements in A, which are unrelated, are all reducible polynomials. And if I estimate the size of that, I have a count on the number of redu reducible polynomials. And if I can show how many polynomials do I have, well, H choices, let's say 2H or whatever, 2H plus 1, choices for each slot. And there are n slots. So it's roughly h to the n, 2 to the h to the n, or whatever. And if I can show it's smaller than h to the n, I'm done. Okay? So that's why I was very careful not to rub this off, because we're now in a position to say, what does it mean to, when I reduce mod p, it's a reducible polynomial. Well, it, it's irreducible. It means it's one of these guys. When I reduce mod p, I get an ir irreducible polynomial. Therefore, it has to be one of these guys. The number of these is this. So I'm going to need this. Hmm? So we see, <coughs> we see that in the notation in our bipartite sieve notation. degree of p, so for each prime p, p is an element now in b. So the b part are the primes. So for each prime p, the degree of p is the number of a's in a, such that a is in p, which means the number of tuples such that um, when I reduce mod p, it, it falls that polynomial is, belongs to these, re, these residues. The, the, every polynomial has a coefficient, and so the corresponding coefficient better fall into that slot. So that means essentially it's the, the counting. How many integers are there in a, in a box or an interval which are congruent to some given number mod p? Well, we know, don't worry about the two H's, okay? So roughly one over P, H over P, <coughs> the number of such things. So we see that this, fix an irreducible polynomial, fix it. We now count how many A0, A1, A2 to AN minus one in this box that are congruent to that fixed thing. That number, as you can guess, is two H plus one over P. smaller order, let me not worry about the order just yet, okay? Uh, so how many are there? They're going to be, um, you have to check for a given number, how many elements are there in an interval? Well, there'll be um, essentially greatest integer of 2h plus 1 over p plus an o of 1. So for each one, it'll be something like this. So we really shouldn't, we really need, need not worry about the plus one over two degree. So we have two H over P plus O one to the N such thing. And for each irreducible polynomial, how many irreducible polynomials are there? There are P to the N over N. So the degree of P is given by this. I do need to worry about the error term here. I need to put it in, but I'm not going to. Okay, I'm not going to put it in. It's, it's irrelevant, actually, but it should be put in, but I would not do it, okay? So if you, can you see immediately now? Why, why is that the degree of P is not the degree of any polynomial? Pardon me? Uh, reducing degree into... I know, degree in the graph series thing. So now we have. You don't have to probably worry about that. 
into them by two because this yeah. O of one will. Yes. So this is not, let's not worry about that. So yeah. Let's, so now what we have, <coughs> let's not even worry about the O of one. Let's just look at this. Okay. We've got two h to the power n over p of the n. P of the n cancels it over n. So it's basically it's coming out to be two h to the power n over n, which does not depend on p. And the error seems to be, well, O of h to the n minus 1 over p, if you like. Let's, let's not, as I said, let's not, uh, because in the interest of time, let's not worry about this error too much. But it's important to keep, it, keep track of it, because it's going to appear in these terms. Okay. So the, this silly term <laughs> does not depend on t. Unlike the you know the usual number number theory setting, you know that's why I can get away with this because if you for those of you who are familiar with the research uh, with the literature, uh, this was solved by Gallagher using large J. But do you have to use the graph argument? Yeah, at the very end for something else. Oh, yeah. For something else. There's nothing to do with this concept, I guess. Yeah. Now. So 2 h to the n over n plus some error term. And so that gives me, what is this? This is equal to um, 2 h to the n is like my cardinality of a, and 1 over n is my delta of p plus error. Okay. So, and then for two such things, what is in my notation n of pq is the number of tuples <coughs> which are common neighbors, right? Common neighbors of I think n minus one. Common neighbors of both p and q. That means <coughs> there are irreducible mod p and there are irreducible mod q. So modulo p I have p to the n over n residue classes, and modulo q I have q to the n over n residue classes total of p to the n, q to the n, q to the n, q to the n over n squared residue classes mod pq. Mod pq. So which are permissible. And then when you work that out, again, the, uh, so it would be 2h, um, so the 2h over pq to the power n, let's just look at the main terms. So it'll be 2h over pq to the power n times the number of irreducible polynomials where p to the n over n, q to the n over n, so it'll be q to the n, q to the n over n squared, plus some error term. And again, the p to the n, q to the n cancel. The density does not depend on pq, p and q anymore. So it's a, dip, it's a, it's a function of n, little n. The main term is, is coming out to be that. Therefore, this mu, if you wrote this mu, you write, uh, this mu is equal to summation b in b delta of b. Right? And so what, what, what are we finding? For each prime, delta of p here is 1 by n. Right? And therefore, this is a constant. And I pick for my set B all the primes less than Z. So pi of Z is here. So what this this uh, mu is coming out to be not log log anything. It's coming out to be big like Z. Okay. So once I've understood that, I see <coughs> I see that the number of A in A, such that omega A is zero, meaning A, uh, the polynomial is reducible. The polynomial corresponding to A is reducible. And the height is less than H. This number is less than or equal to the number of polynomials, basically 2 H to the power N divided by pi of z plus error. <coughs> this 
term is the main term, plus error, these errors. These errors are, if we agreed, were of a smaller order, h to the n minus 1. And you got h to the n minus 1 over 1 over p. Whatever it is, it's a much smaller order uh, in terms of capital H. And I think if you work this out uh, and be very careful with some of the other things, you'll find that the, uh, you can choose z to be something like h to the 1 third. In this, in this particular calculation, h equals, z equals h to the 1 third works. I mean, Gallagher got h, z equals h to the 1 half using guard suit, which is good. But anyway, this is good enough for us. So this elementary sieve can be used now to cho so choose that z equals h to the 1 third. And what do you get? You get h to the n minus 1 third as an estimate for the number of polynomials which are reducible. How many polynomials do I have? h to the n. The number which are reducible is h to the n minus 1 third. Therefore, with probability 1, it's irreducible. Now, as I said, I'm running out of time, and I, I knew that I wouldn't probably be able to fit in the Galois group business. But if I wanted to work on the question of how many polynomials are there such that the Galois group is a symmetric group, well, you need a tiny amount of group theory, and even you know there, uh, not very much uh, to um, analyze the problem. Um, and a similar analysis using this bipartite graph sieve can be used, and you get the result that almost all polynomials of Galois group are fine. So, um, with that, um, I think I'll kind of stop because, um, um, yeah, I think I will stop. What is the reason to think? Um, yeah, he improved. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the exact result, but he improved it. And the results there are coming from um, some algebraic geometric considerations. There's no sieve in that. What is the result? I think the conjecture was um, you see, the number, so what are we getting here? We're getting h to the n minus one third. Gallagher got h to the n minus a half. The conjecture is it should be h to the n minus one. And I think Manjul got uh, that result for some small values of n. I don't think he got it for everything. Uh, uh, up to five degrees. Yeah, up to five, yeah. Up to degree five, he got better. He got whatever is predicted. So it's still an open problem to show that this estimate should be h to the n minus one. So Plus an epsilon, maybe. Yeah. So it is going to be completely solved about maybe as a whole the paper on the app and yeah. the But there is a mistake with those, right? You don't want to call it that. It's really surprising. The author has not been on the paper. Who is that guy? Russell uh, Van. Uh, I forgot to his exact name exactly. And I was really puzzled because I couldn't make out whether that was true or false. Mm. It's not taken very clearly to explain Vandu and his children. Yeah. So Vandu wasn't exclusively convicted. N minus one, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. Vander Warden, okay, let me just say, Vander Warden conjectured uh, h to the n minus one, and in his first paper, got a result like h to the n minus one over log log n or something <laughs> very small. H to the n by <laughs> Uh, no, h to the n minus 1 over log log n. Yeah, yeah, but he used only Eratosthenes. Yeah, he used Eratosthenes sieve. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Right? He used Eratosthenes sieve and managed to get h to the n minus 1 over log log n. Now, 1 over log log n is a function of n, so his thing is, is the, 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 the thing that he's subtracting is getting closer and closer to 0, yeah. and it's getting worse. as. But now we have a fixed thing. I'm saying you can get a fixed thing by this bipartite sieve, which I claim is simpler than Eratosthenes. I mean, it gets better results than Eratosthenes. So this works for SN also? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
It works for asset. You see what? Okay, let me, uh, in, because I have two more minutes left, I'll tell you what the strategy is. The strategy is, what did we do right now? We looked at the polynomial and we mapped it mod p, and we tried to ensure that it was irreducible. Uh, irreducibility of a polynomial mod p means that there's only one irreducible factor. And generally speaking, you could factor a polynomial as a product of irreducible polynomials uniquely. We have unique factorizations here. And so there's a general um, you know, uh, principle in which you can associate a permutation to the factorization. So uh, a permutation in the symmetric group on n letters, which corresponds to if I have R1 linear factor, there will be R11 cycle. If I have R2 quadratic factor, there will be R2 transposition. If I have R3 uh, uh, cubic polynomials as irreducible factors, there will be a three cycle. This is a, this is a theorem you have to yeah. take on faith. It's, it's, it's dedicated uh, algebraic number theory yeah. that the cycle structure uh, of the Frobenius automorphism, which I will <laughs> talk about, um, is corresponds to the way you factor the polynomial mod p. It's beautiful. And so what, I, what you need to do in order to get the Galois group situation is, you need to consider every cycle, possible cycle type structure. So R1, one cycles, R2, two cycles, R, et cetera, et cetera. So fix that, fix the cycle structure. And then do this kind of graph calculation again. So this time, I fix my cycle structure of type R, say. I look at the polynomial, and I associate, I make it adjacent to mod P if the cycle structure of that polynomial is of type R. If R is fixed, of type R. And then I go run through this thing again. And believe me that it works out exactly like this. It's a 3 and minus a third. So you get that. So you've get, got this. Now, if the Galois group is um, a proper subgroup of um, SN, it's not the full group, then it's an elementary calculation in group theory that if you have any group H, which is a proper subgroup of G, the conjugates of that subgroup do not exhaust the group. I, I leave that as an exercise. I think it's a really cute exercise for some of you who, who may not have seen it. The exercise is this. H is a proper subgroup of G. Then the conjugates, the union of the conjugates is not the full group. So this is the group theory lemma that you now need in order to say that if my Galois group is a proper subgroup of SN, the conjugacy classes, the conjugates of that group do not fill the group. Therefore, there's a permutation outside in SN, which is never corresponding to the Frobenius automorphism. And therefore, there's one thing that's missed. So you go, you, you calculated um, all the possible <coughs> reduction types, and so you add them up. There's one type which is never reached, and that's the one that it, it leads to an estimate. So basically, that's how you put it all together. Uh, you use this uh, fact that you, don't, you can't possibly cover the group using these conjugacy classes, and for each conjugacy class, you already made the estimate, and therefore, uh, you must have covered the, the those polynomials with proper Galva, proper subgroup of the Galva group are counted and negligible. So it comes out to be h to the n minus a third there as well. <coughs> and so that then probably will run with SN. So it's a little little longer. Um, takes another half an hour to do, but uh, not that difficult. And, and and as I said, with current research, uh, where people are using new techniques from geometry to try to tackle this. One of our key questions. And 
they haven't resolved it yet, but it's, it's worth uh, studying. I think Rainer Dietman got some. Yeah, yeah, yeah you were working for Rainer. I have a feeling it will get there. Yeah, it yeah. Will more or less the same as it was for uh, Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's not a bad paper if you, anyone's they interested. They rely on speed. Hmm? They rely on speed. Yeah. Okay, so it's interesting stuff. So this is it for the bipartite uh, sieve. Uh, I have three more lectures, I think, left. And I'm going to now talk about least criteria and stuff like that. Photo session? There's a photo session.